So, hey everyone, today we have Austin with us. He's popular for his really good perspective on how to build the product sense. How do you lead a SaaS company as a PM or a SaaS product as a PM? He has worked at two popular companies in the SaaS. One is software, which most of us have used, or we are going to look about it in the program going forward because we have a session dedicated for software, how to use software in order to create a note code product out there. And we'll also go ahead and talk about his past companies, how he was able to transition into product management. So if you are someone who is looking to become a SaaS PM someday, I'm sure you are going to get some really wonderful nuggets of knowledge from Austin in this call. So let's go and get started. So Austin, do you want to go ahead and maybe uh, give a quick introduction about yourself and how do you end up from where you started to a lead product manager at software? Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah. First of all, thank you for having me, Anki. Um, yeah, so my background, so like during the university, I study international relations. So I consider myself more of like a generalist. Uh, and at the time, I didn't really know wh- what I was going to do when I graduated. So uh, unfortunately, like, like the first job I got was in sales and then it happened to be a B2B SaaS uh, startup uh, Series B uh, company. And I was doing pretty, pretty good, uh, pretty well as a SDR. Um, and when I was in the company at the time, I thought, OK, so who build the features like the engineers and designers, right? But then I realized there's a team at the company called, the, uh, they're called program manager uh, at that company. I realized they're the one that actually prioritize the features. And then they actually uh, talk to customers and try to uh, put the features together. And later I learned they are what you know we commonly call as product managers. And that got me really intrigued because like I think that's what I want to do. I, I talked to a lot of people, uh, customers on sales calls, and I try to solve the problem, and I I feel very uh, satisfied just by by offering solutions. And I really want to be on the other side of the fence to actually create the features. So that's when I started learning more about product management. And then you know the next job I officially transitioned into PM, and then later I joined a company called Kluke, which is a kind of a unicorn company um, invested by SoftBank. Uh, Sequoia uh, in uh, Asia, it's kind of like a travel booking uh, platform. And then I move on to Limba and now I am a software as the lead product manager here. Amazing, amazing. So, so thanks a lot for giving that introduction and doing to this, uh, going ahead in this podcast out there. So Austin, I could see that there are three patterns that are emerging from your experience out there. First of all, you transition from sales to product management, being an HDR and then becoming product manager. Second thing is you have gone ahead and talked about like uh, you are a SaaS PM right now. So we are going to dig deeper into that. Like if I want to become a SaaS Mm -hmm. PM, any one of our audience want to become a SaaS PM, what are the things that that they should make care of? And third thing is we are going to talk about the generalist role. Like what are the things that you carry forward from your general profile of sales, marketing or something else out there? And how do you become a product manager? So my first question to start this conversation would be that what were the skills that you already have in the sales profile that you think help you transition into product management? Yeah, I would say uh, as a service person at the time, I think it's really this uh, insight into like um, customer psychology, I would say, because uh, at the time, back about 10 years ago, um, I think at the, a lot of time, like at, at the time, a lot of uh, product manager transition from like an engineering background was like more about how to build something, how to like, you know, get someone from idea to launch. But I think the the customer understanding aspect uh, or the user experience aspect of uh, product management was not as popular back then. So I think being in sales really helped me understand how customers think. Um, and a lot of times it's not as straightforward as, you know, we imagine in our head, like we, we thought, okay, building this feature, right? It's like, um, it makes sense, it's logical. So people will use it and our product will will, will be our competition. But that's not often not how customers think. They have a certain uh, mindset of how things should be done uh, and teaching them new way takes a long time. And I think like nuances like that really helped me think as a user and that really helped me work with designers uh, and then bring something uh, to the table. Because uh, at the time I was not really technical. So I I was able to, you know, 
you know, help engineers scope out architecture or whatever. But uh, I could bring what I could bring is like the user understanding to the yeah. Amazing, amazing. That's that's really good. And just to like extend from that particular question only that you said that you have to make sure that you are. Uh, overcompensating with your existing skill, which is your empathy for other skills, which is the tech. And also, how were you able to do that? Like, how were you able to manage that gap of not coming from a technical background out there and how your team and everything has helped you out over that? Yeah, so I think at the time, uh, so my first official PM role started at a pretty early stage startup. I think at the time, only like 20-ish, 30 people. So I think that gave me a lot of room to uh, figure things out on my own. Like we didn't really have anyone with a real PM background in the company. So I had to figure out how to do user research, uh, how to do prioritization. So, and I think no one, since no one else knows, uh, I was able to kind of be the expert in that, even though I also have, have no prior experience. So um, yeah, this is one tip for a lot of people want to get their first PM role. I'll recommend uh, startup is a, is a good start. Um, maybe Series A, Series B, where there potentially is someone who's experienced to teach you, but at the same time, you have enough room to explore. Yeah, and I think that I was pretty lucky in that regard. Understood. So like your own learning ability, your willingness to go ahead and fill those gaps, take you where you are. Cool. Yeah, yes. And I, I think I, a lot of time, um, yeah, and especially when it comes to technical and design stuff, a lot of time, just ask the the experts in the company. Yes, yes. Uh, I think people are really willing to share. I think very rarely will people look down on you. Say, "Oh, it's PM who does no st stuff." Try to like you know, try to take our time. I think very rarely is that the case. It's usually the opposite. When you don't ask anything and then you pretend you know something or you like really just don't know how to work with people. Uh, on like technical subjects, like people, engineers and designers hate that. But if you yes. really try to understand how it works, they will try to teach you. Yeah, yeah. And then that is the insight we also had. So we have worked with like few product managers out there and we always recommend them that go ahead. And even if you're having certain understanding of tech, it's good to go ahead and ask people out. When you go ahead and take help from people, you're also developing that genuine relationship. So I think that is that is really exactly. good. Yeah, yeah, cool. So I think we can go to the next question. So now you are working into like a good known SaaS company. And we also at Hello PM, when we are teaching our students, we also make sure that we are teaching them some of the no-code tools. And software is like just after Notion that we teach them. So Notion is for generic things and software is for specifically developing the products and all. So I would want to know from you that if someone is there who wants to build their career into a SaaS PM domain out there, working for a SaaS company as a product manager, what should their roadmap be and what are the some pros and cons if you can go ahead and talk about them? Yeah, sure. So I think there's generally two paths that if you are already, a, the first path is if you're already a PM working on other types of product like a consumer product or e-commerce uh, I think usually that's a pretty easy transition because uh, the principle of product management is the same. Like you understand users, you try to deliver value. Uh, yeah, and then you leverage insights. Uh, all of those things are the same. Um, but what you need to learn uh, if you are from that background is to understand like how the SaaS business model works. Um, so usually that in, like that means like looking at different system metrics, know what's like more the common metrics, uh, the common practice, the common UX patterns. Uh, these are all quite different. But I think the most like different part is understand your role uh, as a PM in the a SaaS business model. Um, an analogy I really like to to use is. Uh, think of yourself as an interior designer for different types of uh, buildings. So as a SaaS PM, you can think of yourself as a, you, you designing a hotel because the, the interior, the, the, the decor, the room, the design, it's what really attracts people to come and stay at hotel, right? Um, but if you are a PM at a, let's say, an e-commerce a platform, uh, you do a lot of optimization of kind of the checkout experience, um, the, the browsing experience and all that, but the but that's only how your software is only one aspect of the product. It's like how people deliver, uh, how people get like buy the actual product, which might be like a physical product. So your role is a little different. And then your the stakeholder you work with are is also a little bit different. Like it, 
in like a B2C context, you probably work a lot with the marketing and operation team. Uh, at a SaaS company, usually you have the sales team as well, especially a B2B SaaS. Uh, and then they, they play a big part. You have to, a lot of SaaS companies, like uh, I think we all know which ones, like the product is just terrible, but they are a multi-billion company because they have a great sales team. Uh, and if you happen to be in one of those companies, you just have to understand that like kind of the dynamic uh, and your role on the team is a bit different from your current context. Uh, and then the second path would be people who uh, maybe you're not a PM yet, but you work for a SaaS company. I've seen this transition a lot as well. Uh, and usually um, if you're, let's say you're a customer's facing role, like a support team, and all you can do is try to get involved into uh, get in front of product teams and help them like because you have the kind of the user insight of course the product team should already be talking to users even though in reality you'd be surprised how many companies like don't do that so but as a support member you offer a lot of insights and the product team usually appreciates that and then at the same time uh, you want to improve kind of your technical kind of design like skill on the site and then when the time is right um when you people think, okay, you actually like understand what how to build a product, you have some good ideas, you understand how to uh, extract user insight and not just like take what they say at face value. Then when it's opening, like usually support, uh, even like sales team, like transitioning to PM is becoming more and more common in in SaaS. If you're not in any of these, maybe my suggestion is for you to work into one of these paths first, like either you join a SaaS company that you know has a good product culture first, or you become PM in another um, like business model uh, and then transition to SaaS. Yeah, I think I think that was really insightful. So just to paraphrase it for everyone, then if you are looking to get into SaaS PM, then there are two paths. One is already you are joining the company as a PM. So you have to make sure that your basic product management skills, which is user empathy, understanding the users, understanding the market, how the tech team works and everything should be at place. And you should be able to understand the context of the company as well. And second part is to make sure that, yes, if you are already working in a SaaS company, talk to your managers or talk to your people out there in order to make sure that you are able to make an transition. But here also, he would also suggest that uh, make sure that you are learning product management, understanding product management first so that you are able to make your case stronger. So we have like few, quite a few cases of the same as well. So there is a, like a unicorn company in India, which is known as Freshworks, which is like a big SaaS company. Yeah. Here we have a, we have a student with us who was a front end developer out there. And then he was able to transition into product management management at the same company. And then we also have someone who was working in the customer support at Chargebee. And now he was able to make a transition. So I think yeah. internal transition we have seen in one of the easiest ways in which you can go ahead and become a product manager out there. Yeah. So yeah. thanks a lot for that context. Now, Ashton, I have next question for you, which is that uh, maybe let's take the uh, example of your company out there. So let's say if software wants to, to build a feature, what is the end-to-end -end cycle that you go through so that we can understand and people can understand, get a sneak view into a sneak preview into how the product management is actually done. Yeah, so I would say uh, software, right? Just for context, we are about 40 people right now, a Series A uh, company, uh, been around for about three years now. So still very early stage compared to a lot of com other companies. And um, so building a feature as software, I think we have a slightly different approach than the companies that, you know, other companies that I know. Um, so we separate the features into kind of kind of the improvements, like the small improvements, and then also the kind of the big bets. Uh, for small improvements, like we move really fast, like uh, extremely fast. Uh, usually, a lot of people, new joiners joining the company, they get surprised just the the amount of uh, improvement we have in the backlog and the amount of like the, the speed that we're actually able to ship them. Uh, and that's what make the companies uh, special. A lot of customers love us uh, because of that. And the reason we're able to do that uh, has to do with our continuous uh, customer discovery. Like uh, on the PM side, we talk to users uh, weekly, uh, at least I would say three, three times. Uh, we have, we offer like onboarding call, which is a very good way to, you know, talk to users, uh, understand what they're thinking. 
yeah, so for those features, usually PMs, we have the most context. We scope them out. Uh, and a lot of times, uh, personally, I have, uh, I've, I've kind of self-learned how to do design. So, and with the help of kind of design system, a lot of times I just do that design myself. Uh, it really depends on how small it is. Because uh, right now we do have uh, a few PMs and a few designers on the team, but there was a period of time where I was the only PM and then we had like one, two designer at the time and then they were on vacation. So I basically just do all the design myself uh, uh, at the time. So yeah, small improvements, I would say it's more fluid. Uh, we try to move really fast. Yeah, idea, uh, you know, scope it out, spec it out, um, you know, send to engineer. A lot of people will kind of, like kind of subscribe to kind of more modern part of will say, oh, this is too like uh, waterfall-ish. You kind of do a handoff. But I really wouldn't say so because the small improvement, I know that once you get to designer, you know, I can have them do that discovery and uh, scoping or I can have the engineer do the same. They'll arrive at the same conclusion. So as a PN, I have the context. I know how to do that in the fastest way. Then I should do that. Uh, and we really want to save uh, the time to do like proper discovery, like project-based discovery for the big bets. Cause those are features that, uh, you know, kind of like unknown, like no one else have ever solved that problem before. Or uh, we know it has like, a, like they like, like connects to every other parts of the product. So we want to do them well. And those are usually a lot more collaborative. Like as PN, I, I kind of like scope out the problem. Sometimes it might not even be correct because as the, you know, we go deep into the problem, we talk to more users, we might realize there's something that we're missing. So yeah, the big bets are where we spend the time to go through that collaborative process. We involve engineer early on, kind of explore a few solutions. And then once kind of the high level concept is is uh, is confirmed and we then work on the more high fidelity user flow uh, and then get a ship. But there, even during development, there's always gonna be a lot of, uh, back and forth. Um, so a lot of times we realize, okay, something we thought would work, actually we missed this kind of uh, edge case, which is turned out to be not that of edge case. It's actually quite common that we have to change a solution. Yeah, so uh, to, to kind of basically summarize, small improvement moves super fast, uh, just kind of rely on our continuous customer understanding. Big bets, uh, we try to be really more collaborative, explore different options. Sometimes even think about, okay, is there a way that we can reinvent the wheel a little bit? Uh, maybe like we do things differently. Yeah, so that's uh, generally it. That's good. So yeah, so just to rephrase everything, as in the question is how software builds product. So first of all, you are going to make sure that you are taking that user perspective. And for that, you guys are pretty aggressive. You go ahead and at least talk to users three times, two times a week in order to understand that context. Then you'll try to create like a low fidelity design by yourself. And then you try to understand if it is going to be like a product that is going to touch other teams out there. So you are going to be collaborative in that particular approach out there. Then you'll turn to the designers, help them solve the problem, turn it into a high fidelity prototype or something, and then go to the designer in order to get the work done. Is, is that the correct correct process? Um, or I missed something? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think a little different. I think it depends on the uh, kind of the nature of the feature. If it's more like small improvement that we know, okay, everyone asked for, and there's nothing nothing tricky, like we would just, uh, we would like, like PM will kind of scope it out as in quite detailed, even sometimes just, because uh, we kind of want our PMs to have, to not just be kind of a, someone points out the problem. We want the PM to also have a pretty good like uh, sense in terms of UX and uh, uh, like UX and UI experience. So usually the PM will just scope it out for the small imp improvements, pass the designer, pass the engineer to get it done. A lot of times that's within the time frame of a week, sometimes, in my early days, sometimes even like two, three days. Um, and for kind of the bigger topics, yeah, we usually go through a slightly more collaborative process where I would probably just set the groundwork in terms of the problem, the context, and maybe a high level solution, but it's not as linear as the smaller improvements. 
cool understood so it depends on the context mm-hmm. it depends on what you are developing at that yeah. period of time cool yeah. understood yeah. and one one more question i wanted to ask you which is about like a different topic so your blog post on product sense is like got popular on linkedin and over the internet i also send it to so many people out there so i want to know from you that if if someone wants to develop product sense first of all what is product sense if you can tell us in brief and then you can tell us few exercises that we can do in order to improve our product sense overall yeah um i think uh, first of all i think like uh it got popular because you shared it uh every time you shared it you got, you got like a lot of uh visit to my blog so thank you for that yeah but um product sense i think it's a it's a kind of a very vague concept right i think if we were to break it down we can kind of refer back to the you know the Venn diagram we 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 often see you know what a what a product manager is you you you're intersect between the user experience the business and kind of more like technical knowledge. Then usually when people say product sense they don't talk about the technical part as much, but I actually think it is also part of it. It is like a very uh, inclusive idea of process but basically we can break it into uh, users uh, user experience and on that part you need to have really good user understanding uh, user empathy uh, but user empathy is only one part um, user understanding in my definition is a little broader because a lot of times like understanding what users think is not enough you also have to understand all right this is what they say they're going to do but it's not actually what they do in reality. Like we often see that happening, um, especially in like maybe consumer product, right? Uh, you know, people always say, oh, Instagram is bad. Like, I don't want to be compared to other people. But then everyone, you know, still at the end, they kind of addicted to it. Like they enjoy that getting that likes, um, whatever. And I think this type of um, like user psychology is a very important one. Uh, and the second part is kind of a business side of thing, business acumen. Uh, you need to have like enough kind of business literacy to understand how your product makes money for the business, how, how it grows. And sometimes that means like purely growing the user account and think about revenue later. Sometimes it means sustainable revenue from day one, which is what I think most like top SaaS companies do these things. Uh, yeah, and then the third, like pillar, which is kind of the the technical aspect of things, um, I think it is also pretty important because, like, in order to kind of know what solution you can provide, right? Like when you're exercising your product sense, you still need to be able to kind of understand. All right, um, uh, is this solution like even possible? Uh, are we talking about? one or two days or we're talking about like building something for three months so i think having that level of understanding is still very important and for other pms out there i think the practical exercise you can do uh in to improve your user understanding uh is to um actually not not just user understanding. i would say like probably all three things is to just look at any product you use daily uh, whenever you try a new product you try to ask a couple of questions. Uh, well, I think uh, in my blog post I list out. I call it the the the, the three what and the three the three how. So you ask. Okay, you think about you know in your head, right? What problem is it solving? Uh, who has this problem? Uh, who are they competing against? Uh, maybe not like a direct competitor. Maybe it's like some existing way of doing things. Um, and also you you think about okay, how are they solving this problem differently than the existing solutions? And how does it make money? And then how is your own experience using this product, right? And then you can often find new products to try just going on Product Hunt, uh, TechCrunch. Uh, you can ask yourself these questions as you go through it. And uh, yeah, you don't don't try to answer this question just in your head though. You want to actually look through the landing page, go through the product, uh, you know, go online, go to their community if they have one to look at how people talk about it. And if people care about the same thing that you thought was important or if uh, your interpretation was correct. And then through kind of this like uh, exercise and based on real validation, you will get better at, uh, you know, product sense. So whenever you look at a similar product in the future or a similar challenge, you will be Get, you will be better at you know, pattern matching. Like uh, maybe not exactly the same, but you can take up parts that, okay, oh yeah, this is uh, similar. Maybe I can try it here. 
yeah, so I think that's how you generally improve product sense. Understood. I think I think that's good. And you also talk about like finding the pattern. So I'll also uh, like get your advice on some of the books that you also recommend so that people are able to find these patterns which are already found by some other people and they can make the use of the same. So any of the books that you recommend for some of the aspiring product managers and some seasoned product managers as well? Yeah, so so in terms of like finding patterns, um, I actually don't recommend reading books for that because uh yeah i think in books usually you you read the perspective of the the author that gives you some perspective which is good but i think a lot of times you can become too rigid like you start to think okay that's the only way to approach it but uh but more generically if i were to recommend a book the design of uh, everything the design of everyday thing is a it's a, it's a good one because it really I think that basically embodies how you can improve product sense, right? You look at an object like that's not really a digital product. Let's say uh, next to me, I have a, like a remote control for uh, air conditioning. I can look at it and see how it's been designed and what is good, what is not good. And I think that's how you generally improve uh, product sense. So yeah, that's the one book I would uh, recommend because you really get you to think, okay, all these are the thoughts that go into it. Uh, yeah. Amazing. I mean, that's so interesting perspective. Thanks a lot for that, Austin. And then we'll have like one more question, which is about software only. So software is like one of the leaders in the no code tool uh, environment ecosystems out there. So now how do you think that like the future is going to change for PMs with the help of these no code tools out there? How do you think like in the PM toolkit, these things are going to settle over there? And how do you think product management going to change that because of introduction of such tools? Yeah, uh, I would say like in reality, I think the definition of no code is always pretty vague. Uh, to be honest, like uh, probably thirty years ago, Excel would be considered a no code because back in the day, people have to actually, uh, and like I think like uh, code like a spreadsheet. Yeah, so the definition is always changing, but in general, I think it it changes uh, product management as a profession in in two ways. I think first of all, it's more for kind of a learning um, because there's a there's a joke, right? <laughs> like uh, PM don't actually build anything. Like uh, it's the designer engineers, in theory, they can just ship stuff on their own, even though we know it's not how it works in reality. But I think this uh, no-code tools is a really great way for PMs to learn how to ship something on their own. And, and it's great because the right amount of abstraction like, you don't actually have to go through bootcamp to learn the syntax, um, like with JavaScript, to learn like a, like a JavaScript library. You don't have to do that, but you just have to understand the concept and you will be able to use these tools uh, properly. And there's no excuse of not doing that, right? And because like designing, let's say, a, a, a base in Airtable, that's essentially database design. You try to uh, think about what's the best way to store certain data in what data type and how do they connect to another table, which is essentially an object in traditional programming uh, you know, uh, language. Uh, and yeah, I think that really helps PM to, to build those, to, to be hands-on on those uh, like design and engineering that really give them a better sense of uh, you know, what good looks like uh, in, a, in the output. Uh, and I think in the past, let's say five years, like the tech industry is kind of in the bull market. So a lot of PMs, like they really, all they do is like high level stuff, but which will, will work if you work, you know, you know, big company. But if you want to join a startup, you need to really know, all right, what the, what a good solution looks like and be able to really, give those feedback at the very least to designer and engineer, all right, what looks right, what does it look right and why is that the case? Yeah, and that's the first part, just for personal learning, uh, just launching some side project as well, even just on the side to build up your portfolio. And the second part is uh, more around, like at work, you can actually use it to build some internal tools or prototypes. Uh, I've seen that a lot with the software uh, customers. Uh, they come to us, they can build, they can go and buy some um, vertical SaaS product uh, for their internal needs. Um, but a lot of times it's too, first of all, too expensive and also too, too rigid, like it doesn't fit how they work. So they rather build something uh, on their own and they can do that easily. 
Um, and a lot of times those are tools that don't even have an existing solution. Um, a good example I can um, share within software, like how we talk through our own product for our internal operation is that we have this uh, expert directory that uh, you know, allow that allows to track, okay, who's our expert, what their profile is, and they can also log in to change their own profile. And we build that entirely with software and also our website as well. And they, we, we don't need to rely on engineers help for those kind of things. Um, yeah, so I think that's really a good uh, way to speed things up. Yeah, and I think it's more just prototyping. Um, sometimes, um, some product, right? You have an idea you want to present to internal stakeholders, or maybe you just want to test like how that end-to-end -end flow looks like. Uh, maybe like you can do it in Figma as well as just a prototype, but maybe that's still not realistic enough, uh, or maybe it doesn't really help you to understand the feasibility, right? And you can do that with software or other no -code tools to, to you know, help people see. Okay, this is what a prototype looks like. Um, like and so people get get your idea to decide whether they want to move forward or not. Amazing, amazing. So I could see like two themes out there. First is you can definitely use it for quicker iterations and making sure that you are creating MVPs by yourself without bothering your developers and all if not needed yeah. and, and designers as well. And second is like you can also use it to create internal tools. So I think that is also like a bigger trend that is moving that people rather than going for niche products for going certain kind of internal things, they are using the, the no-code tools as well. So I think, yeah, that was really good insight. And one more thing I was able to draw from this conversation was that I believe you are working as a, uh, as a remote PM at software. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. So uh, yeah. I think our team's primary remote, especially on product and uh, design team, I think everyone just is everywhere. Uh, we have, I'm in Taiwan and uh, we have a PM in Australia uh, and a few other in, or all around Europe. Uh, yeah, we don't have someone in Canada now. Great, great, great. So, so if you can tell maybe some of the tips for the viewers, for, to the listeners about uh, how do you land a remote PM role? That's the first part. Second part is how do you make sure that you are working at your best productivity and delivering your best by being a remote PM? Because we understand it's a work of collaboration and also a few tips on the same portion. Yeah. Um, so I kind of land, I, you know, I started working remotely since my last job at uh, Lambon. So it was kind of uh, the founder also found me through my article. So, and that was the first remote person the, the company was in based in Spain. I was the first remote person outside of Spain at the time. So uh but it is required a little bit convincing of that okay I can do the job. So in the first two months I actually volunteered to just be in the office, right? Just to talk to everyone under like you know build that personal connection. And I think that's very helpful. Uh they don't really do that as software, but we still meet once a uh, year uh, during offsite to to have that some in person time, which I think is still important. But to succeed at the, I think a remote job uh, at the core, I don't think it's any different from uh, being a PM or doing any work at like any person job. Uh, and actually a lot of like bigger companies, you spend most of the time working with your colleagues in another time zone, in other office anyway. So it's really, the difference is not huge. But in remote, uh, in a remote context, uh, especially, I think you just have to over communicate everything and be really good at synchronous communication. Uh, and that entails a, a couple of things that I recently wrote about. Uh, a lot of PM don't care is the kind of when you, let's say you have a PRD or maybe a product brief, right? Uh, you wanna make sure that people actually read it and then you wanna make sure that you write it in a way that is easy for others to consume. I Means you know, use the good format, um, use some visuals, uh, really like uh, make your sentence like easier to read, more conversational, and all that. And that that takes a little time to to master, and takes definitely takes more time to to refine that that document. Uh, uh, you know, as opposed to you know just write out whatever is on your mind and then share it to others. And sometimes you also have to proactively address questions, right? Because uh, the downside of remote and the synchronous work is that you don't get another person's like kind of immediate feedback. So you kind of have to anticipate, all right, so I shared this idea here. What are some potential questions that might come up as follow up? And then maybe you just have a Q&A section that 
proactively address those. So whoever is reading through, they don't have to wait until, let's say, three hours later or the next day for you to get back to them about, about those uh, answers. Yeah, I think I think that's good. So one theme uh, that I was able to take from this uh, like last five minutes of the conversation is like communication. So when you are communicating, you are you are communicating on the internet, you are able to go ahead and also find the job out there. And when you are communicating well into your own team in a cut, certain structure out there, you are able to make sure that yes, people are actually reading or listening what you're about to say. So I think yes, that's that also like uh, focusing on the part that yes, we should be very good yeah. as also written communicators as a PM. Yeah, out there. yeah, yeah. written. Yeah, I would say whatever format. So I, I kind of approach it as like a, like an experience, right? It's like it's like a design almost. Yes, uh, yes. And I would say even like writing, let's say in Notion, in like Google Doc is a little different from writing on Slack even because you, you kind of have to think about, all right, what, uh, what elements is available to make this conversation more effective, let's say. Uh, it sounds kind of superficial, but like on Slack, you have emoji, which I really believe is a, a very important tool, especially kind of just like to make the conversation lively. Um, uh, another important tip here is that since remote, people really don't know your tone, like, 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 uh, so people kind of, kind of imagine their head. So by default, like a lot of times remote communication, writing, written communication sound very like cold. So sometimes you do have to be a little more intentional, you know, adding exclamation mark, adding emoji to like, to kind of make that tone more obvious. Otherwise people might feel like it's very transactional conversation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. So that's really good. If you can maybe go ahead and share about one of your good achievements at your current company software or maybe at Landbot. So one of the things that you have created and you are really proud of the same. So if you can walk us through the process, why do you think it was important to you? Yeah, so I always like don't know how to answer this question. A lot of people ask me uh, what's like one project you have shipped. To me, I think uh, at both company, um, I was kind of the one of the first PM and the probably majority of the feature ever since I joined. So uh, yeah, I really can't pinpoint maybe one particular feature, but a lot of times just like the collectively how the product has evolved. Um, so for example, a software, uh, yeah, when I joined, uh, the product was already really good. Um, so like really uh, thanks to the team that was there before me. And, but I think I did a lot of work in terms of really carrying the, the founder's vision to another level. Like, uh, and I think to be able to have, you know, kind of our founder's trust on that is, is a really proud moment because we, and to me, that's like really good too. It's just like constantly shipping. I think the, the, the speed of shipping and then the, like the, the rate of, uh, like, um, uh, how constant we're to able to deliver value to our users. Like, uh, I think a software is uh, like the, yeah, the best I've seen anywhere in my own career. And also people like companies that I have some insight into, I think that's something I'm, I'm really proud of uh, because having that flexibility to, to bring that philosophy to life is also uh, very important. Like uh, I know in some other companies, there are people who really try to follow the more how to say the kind of more uh the textbook product management approach oh you gotta do discovery you validate and you uh, do a b test to make sure okay why well, you bring like you, you actually push a metric um in a way yeah software we are able to kind of build a product culture where we don't care as much about that at, at least now uh, like at the, the feature level like we care a lot about understanding the users um, and then solve the problem in a very creative way. Uh, and one thing that makes us different as a no code tool is that uh, you know, everyone has heard of Bubble and it's a very robust tool, but we're not trying to be like them because we know to use it well, you still need a lot of technical knowledge, but we try to build our tool to, to make an average person um, uh, even like uh, someone who's like not very tech savvy to be able to build like uh, the app they can call their own. Uh, we do have a lot of users like that. You know, uh, we, I was talking to someone 70 years old, uh, like work at a university. I uh, don't think she really know how to use computer that well, but she's about to use software. And I would say, yeah, that's probably something I'm like super proud of, just having a product uh, that really 
uh, allow people, empower people and uh, in approach that we want to. Yes. So I think that's really interesting. And, uh, and also like this is also comes to be a foundation of why we are doing all of this. So understand, we think that product management, rather than looking at it as a job, you look as a way to go ahead and empower people because all of us are being empowered because of some of the products that we are using. The Zoom allows yeah, us right. to go ahead and talk to ourselves with, when yeah. we are remote. These headphones allows us to express ourselves in the best possible way and listen to other people. So I think product is the leverage, product management is a leverage that you get in your life, like once in a lifetime moment where you go ahead and maybe create something yeah. for so many people out there. So I think that's a great leverage and the empowerment that you get while creating these kinds yeah, of yeah. products. Yeah. Yes, it's amazing, a good amazing. perfect, right? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's good perfect. It's it's uh I probably wouldn't feel the same. This is this is not too trash on other profession, but I probably won't feel as proud if I do stock trading, for example. Yeah. But I feel I'm proud of that. Give me a sense of uh, uh accomplishment and the purpose. So that's why I want to improve my craft and be a prop, better product manager. Yes, yes, yes. The, and yeah, and and like the the second part of that question that yes, from your own experiences, everything out there, like you working at software. Now, if someone is approaching to you for a product management job at your company, okay, mm -hmm. so what are the things that you are going to suggest them? What are the best practices that they should have? So that if you are looking for a candidate for a good product management role, what are the skills that you want to see to them? And if they are reaching you, maybe before applying to the company, they want a roadmap from you. What are you going to suggest them in order to learn and everything? Yeah, good question. Uh, I would say like generally, like, whenever we like interview PMs or designers or just anyway in general, uh, not just in software context, just uh, even in my past job, uh, I look for a few things. Uh, so the skill level really depends on the seniority that we're hiring. Obviously, if we're hiring someone senior, then we expect the person to to have demonstrate the same level of knowledge. Um, but regardless of the seniority, I think one thing that's very important to me is uh are they kind of are they curious about the profession or do they kind of approach it as some sort of uh job where they just kind of follow the the textbook answers right one one um you know to put it another way like are they a first principle thinker like we we talk a lot like we hear this word a lot but in my definition this is uh, a first principle thinker is someone who First, they understand what the best practices are and why people recommend them. But at the same time, uh, they also approach uh, this, this. They try to like explore. Okay, is there a better way to do things? And I think to me that's uh, one really good sign that someone uh, is a good PM candidate. And also like this demonstrate curiosity that they're not just uh, their their skills not just based on experience only. Because experience, I feel like experience can only take you so far. I think being a product manager, you are you're going to work on a lot of problems that has never been solved before. And you want to be a real problem solver. Now, not just someone who has done it once so you can do it again. I mean, obviously that's important. Uh, we hope the candidate have that experience, but it's more important that they can be a genuine problem solver that whatever you throw at them, they can analyze it uh, like explore creative solution to solve it yeah so so that's uh that's yeah probably i would combine that with one just having that first principle thinking uh skill uh and the second part would be kind of like uh how they balance everything right like do they balance qualitative insight do they balance quantitative uh uh information and how do they like uh, combine them together uh i've seen a lot that people People always say, "Oh, yeah, you have to do both." You yeah, and then, but the when you actually throw them some question or ask them to to work on a task, they usually lean toward one or the other. They mm -hmm. they just base everything purely on qualitative insights or intuition, or they um, look at data like in a very like rigid way. That's which at the end of the day is always going to be biased. Um, so I really want to see how they are able to demonstrate, okay, how do I actually leverage both uh, in my job to deliver uh, a good user uh, user value? Yeah, so I would say that's the two things I look at. And then I also really like, uh, you know, Peter Thiel's uh, question 
um, during interview that, okay, what's your contra contrarian take on something? Uh, I think that's really, I usually ask that during interview as well. Um, I mean, it's not, it's not like a determining, it's, it's not like an end all be all question, but it really helps me understand that does this person uh, think about how he works or not? And I think to me, that's, uh, that's, that's pretty important. Um, yeah. And then maybe for more practical tip for anyone um, who's applying for another company at PM job, this is this always surprises me. Like use the product, like spend half an hour, use the product. Like you will beat at least 80 to 90% of the candidates. Yeah. It's amazing. I mean, that's interesting. And, and for everyone, we are actually, we have a program known as technology for product and business folks where we have started teaching these no-code tools as well. So initially, we started with teaching them SQL, system design, APIs, and everything. Now, in this particular cohort, we are also creating some content on software, Airtable, Notion, how do you make sure that you are able to use Retool and these kind of tools, along with Postman and Google Firebase. So that we are introducing. And, and Austin, I would love to share with you like one of the slides that we are creating for software, and I would love to have your review there as well, so that it comes from the horse's mouth itself. So Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Um, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, we're yeah. probably including our yes, newsletter yes. as well. Great, great, great. So yes, so so to just go ahead and conclude everything out there. So Austin, I'll just go ahead and to conclude, uh, ask the same question from you, which Peter Thiel uh, suggests to ask, which is what is your contrarian view? What is you think is true while other people around you might not agree with? Yeah, that's a good question. I didn't, didn't expect that to get uh, thrown back at me right away. But <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, I'll pick one. I have quite a lot, actually, but I'll pick one off the top of my head that whenever I said this, uh, I always get like a like a weird like a gaze from the PM. So first of all, I think like uh, using data, like I consider myself a very data um, literate PM. Like I can do very deep analysis that you know usually you would need a data scientist to do. But I really think that, um, say for example, tracking, uh, measuring everything is it's like a, it's kind of the worst advice out there. Like uh, in reality, first of all, you can't measure everything. That that just the fact you can't. Uh, and there's really no time for you to measure everything. Like even if you can, right? Okay, what are you gonna do with most of it? Like uh, a lot of time, the data you're measuring is by default just just biased because there's really isn't it's not it's it's biased not be, not because you the way you collect it is it, not good there's simply no way around it for example right your company you rely you have a lot of data about your users but those people come in the fact that they come into your product is already kind of like, like makes your data biased like maybe your bigger the, the real market you want to get to, like you don't have them on your platform. So so in a sense that data you're looking at is not comprehensive and there can never be comprehensive pro uh, data for you to look at. So uh, no, being comfortable with that reality, I think it's, uh, it's kind of my hot take. And also a lot of people say, oh, you got to make decision based on data as if data actually going to tell them how to make that decision. Like um, 10 people can look at the same set of data and have 10 sets of interpretation. I think at the end of the day, being very uh, philosophical, it's always going, it's always subjective in a lot of sense. Like the, the data you get is objective. It's a, it's a fact, but how you interpret it, uh, maybe even in the beginning, how you get this data is our subjective, yeah. Yeah, I think I think I think and, and that comes with a lot of experience that you are already getting. So that's a wonderful insight yeah. that I was able to take away from the session yeah, today. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, Austin. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot. I think uh, people who are watching this podcast, doing this podcast on YouTube, I think they are going to find a lot of value from the same. Again, thanks a lot for doing this with us, Austin. So yeah, it's a pleasure. Okay, uh, really.